husband, um, Chris and I have been married for 18 years, and in that time, we have learned a lot about communication, a lot about compromise, a lot about cooperation, um, and any relationship you're in, whether it's a marriage, whether it's between your siblings, whether it's at work, school, friends, there is from time to time going to be conflict. So it's good to just know that up front and then to practice the skills that help you get through conflict in a healthy way. Because nobody's going to live a life free of conflict. Everybody knows that's coming in one way or another. So it's good to have the skills and the characteristics that are going to help you navigate through difficult moments in life. Chris and I have had our fair share in 18 um, plus years of arguments we've had, sometimes that we've done a really good job at fighting fair, other times we've not been in a great place. But one that sticks out to me, I'm sure, I'm sure you've had this argument. It was an argument about curtains. I'm sure this has happened in your life, such a common you know, argument. Um, but we made the really wise move about six years ago to move. We were gonna move to a new house. And we were moving, at the time we had a four-year-old and a six-month-old, so a very easy time to relocate to a new home. That was no big deal. We also did what, what you would call an in-town move. Have you ever done an in-town move? It sounds so easy, right? You're just gonna move right over there, no big deal. It's the same amount of work. You still have to put everything you've ever bought or owned in some type of vessel, box, something, and get it to the new place. But what we did was decide, look, we don't even need movers, incorrect. And we'll just do it a little bit at a time. So it, all it does is make an unpleasant thing just last a really long time. That's the path that we chose. So we're moving slowly, we're moving into a new house, which in theory, again, is great, but there was nothing on the walls. Like if you move into a house that somebody's lived in, there's like a towel bar, right? Or there's a curtain rod. None of that stuff was there because this is a new house. So Chris would go every day after work and spend two or three hours just knocking through these projects on the list. I would get the kids and be home with them, do like dinner and bath and whatever. So this was the plan that we had made. So we've been doing this for about a week. They were in this house, in this living room, these three beautiful windows, and I had picked out what I thought were very lovely curtains for these windows. And so as a project I was kind of excited about, he had been working on this project maybe two nights. It was you know, a big job by himself, on a ladder, measuring and all this stuff. So he calls me, he goes, they're done. You've got to see the curtains. You're right, they're beautiful, come on over. So I wrangle the four-year-old and the six-month-old. We get in the car, we drive across town. I walk in and just froze. Y'all, it looked awful. <laughs> Could not have looked worse. And I'm thinking like, okay, like think about your face, right? You know, the curtain rods are not level. They're like, they're all like this. And I'm like, I'm not pleased. I would not say I handled it in the best way that I could have, okay? <laughs> And I was like, Chris, it's awful. Like, it, it's not level. And he said, it is level. And I was like, whew, buddy. I mean, and so we argue about this for several minutes. And, and we're getting more and more angry because here he has put all this time into this. He's been on a ladder. He's tired. I had been at work all day and then was taking care of the kids. I am frustrated because <laughs> it feels like he's been on a vacation at the new house, right? Hanging these crooked curtains. So we're just so furious at each other. Finally, he says, they're level and I'll prove it. And I'm like, great, get the level out. He puts the level on the curtain rods, 100% level. I was like, okay, I don't know if you have a magic level, I don't know, but that, I'm looking at it. As it turns out, it was the crown molding above the curtain rods that was not completely level. So to your eye, it didn't look right. Two straight, should have been straight lines. One was just slightly off, not enough to hurt anything or cause any problems, but enough to make the curtains look wrong. Now, I tell you that to say that we were having this argument and he was 100% sure that he was right. And I was 100% sure that I was right. And you know what? We were both right. We were both right. He was right. He'd measured them two and three times. They were level. I was right. It did not look level. It looked bad. We came into this argument from different perspectives, in the end, both technically right. But in life, we are all limited by the perspective from which we see things. And sometimes what happens when we approach a difficult situation, sometimes much bigger deal than curtains, you can imagine, and you dig into your perspective and you say, I am right. It does not matter what you say. I know that I'm right. 
And we can only see things the way we see them in our natural um, perspective, and it takes work to see stuff from a different way. If I brought, you know, four or five of you up here, blindfolded you, and then brought an elephant out on this, don't get excited, we're not doing that today. <laughs> Sorry to the online folks, there are no elephant. If I blindfolded a few of you, brought an elephant out, and one of you touched the tail, and one of you touched the trunk, somebody else touched the tusks, and somebody else patted the elephant on the side. And then I said, okay, describe the animal. You would have four or five completely different answers. Who would be correct? Everybody. It's because that's the particular perspective that that person approached it from. And so we have a really hard time with this, especially as grown-ups. I think it gets worse almost as we get older. We work so hard to prove our point. We are so into the fact that we are right, that we know best, and we struggle with an idea that we're gonna get into today called humility. I, I don't know, I've not lived outside the United States. It's uniquely an issue in the United States right now. I think this idea of rightness, that I'm out to prove to you that I know the right way that I have the right answer, that I'm voting for the right person, that I'm going to the right school, whatever thing it is, we get so into proving that we're right, surrounding ourselves with people that think the same thing that we do, and we really struggle with humility. It is hard to say. This is hard to get it out of our mouth. I do not know everything. Let's practice. Everybody say it. I do not know everything. Some of you are like, I don't wanna say that. <laughs> I wouldn't lie in church, right? <laughs> It's tough to admit that we don't know everything. There's a phrase we've been working on in our house, and it originated with the curtain crisis. We've been working on this phrase, I could be wrong. This little phrase that we try to, when we feel that heat start to rise, when people are digging their heels in, and you're, you've got your perspective, and you've got your perspective, and, and we've tried to teach ourselves to go, you know what, I could be wrong. I'm fairly sure that that's what happened or that's what was said, but I could be wrong. Let's check or let's, let's let it lie. I will tell you, that little phrase is a great one to practice. It's a great little tool to kind of remind yourself, I don't know everything. When you think about being the parent of a teenager who is experiencing life from his or her own perspective, as a parent, it's very tempting to go, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, but what if we had the humility to listen to our teenagers or our kids or teenagers and kids? What if you had the humility to listen to your parents Setting a tone that, you know what, I could be wrong. I'm gonna listen. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna stop and hear what you have to say. Another helpful phrase, um, Shauna Nequist just wrote a whole book about this that I would recommend to you. The phrase is, I just haven't learned that yet. Somebody in your life is talking to you about something and you're like, I have no idea what that is. Instead of assuming that they're wrong, what if you just said like, you know what, I haven't learned that yet. I, I need to learn more about it. I, I need to understand a little bit more about, you can also use the phrase, tell me more about that. Instead of shutting someone down or immediately telling them that you don't agree or that they're wrong, what if you try this phrase, tell me more about that. To give yourself the mental time and space, space in your own heart and spirit to just be a listener. That kind of behavior, that's gonna set a tone. Setting the tone is what this whole series has been about so far in this new year. We're talking about set the tone. How do we set the tone in our lives to be followers of Jesus who are making a difference? This whole series is based out of a passage in Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 14. We read it every week. I'm going to read it again to you. If you have missed some of the previous messages in the series, go back and get those. You'll want to hear those. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We've already talked about compassion. Stephen talked to us last week about kindness, which I definitely recommend that you hear that one. That's a word we don't always talk about. But today we're gonna talk about humility. These characteristics in this passage in Colossians, these are the characteristics that we need to have if we wanna be followers of Jesus. This is gonna set the tone for our life. Certainly it's gonna set the tone for 2023. And so today we're going to consider what it means to be humble. Sometimes when you hear that word, like knee-jerk reaction is like, 
Humility is like putting yourself down or diminishing yourself in some way. And that's unfortunate because humility does not mean putting ourselves down. Um, So we're going to dig into this word humility. We're going to ask three questions. We're going to ask who, we're going to ask why, and we're going to ask how. So it's kind of the old like scientific questions you might ask at school. We're going to go why humility, who is humble, how do we do it? So we're going to work our way through those questions. So the first question is, why should we be humble? Why does that make the list? of things that we're being told these are ways to have characteristics of Jesus. The Greek word translated as humility literally is referring to height. So it's referring to making yourself low or close to the ground. Um, The Latin root of the word humble or humus means ground or earth. So low to the ground, earth, it's a component of humility because it's reminding us that we all came Um, from dust, that we are all created beings, none of us created ourselves, but that we're all imperfect creations, that each of us have sin in our lives, each of us have brokenness in our lives, and we're going to work our way through several scriptures as we kind of try to get a biblical picture of humility to bring that all back together and close the circle for us, so we're going to read in Romans chapter 3, 22 through 24. If you're a Christian or have been around this church for all, you've heard this passage, but this is the why of humility. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. The first step of becoming a Christian is humility. That's the very first part of being a Christian. You cannot become a Christian, you cannot become a follower of Jesus without taking the step to say, hello, My name is Sinner in Need of Grace. The first step towards Jesus is a step of recognition, of confession, of acceptance that I'm an imperfect person in need of a Savior. So our very entrance into this life of following Jesus is this step of humility, is admitting that we're sinful, that we need a Savior. That is what humility is all about. That's the very starting point is to say, you know what? I don't know everything. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all figured out. I'm not all that. It's the answer to why we need humility is that we've all fallen short of God's glory. You can look around this room. People watching in Johnson City, the people watching online, you can look around wherever you are. All of us have fallen short of the grace of God. Every single person in this room, every single person on earth is in need of a savior. So the first step to following him is admitting that. Admitting that we need a savior. Now, even those of us that have done that, it is easy to like quickly take like an exit ramp off that path of humility of saying, we all need a savior because sometimes what happens is we go, well, I need a savior, but some of y'all really need a savior, (laughs) right? You start to like rank other people's sins or be like, I mean, I need a savior, but like some of those people are just like really far off. And you start to focus on the sins and the behaviors of other people instead of your own path. And that is a way I think the enemy sees like, oh, oh, that person's on a path of humility. They understand that, you know, they need a savior. Why don't I get him or her concerned with somebody else's sin instead of their own? And then they're not a threat anymore as a follower of Jesus. Because actual humility means we don't worry about the sin and the behaviors in other people's lives in terms of judging them or correcting. We say, no, you know what? God has asked me to be in my lane and to make sure that I'm paying attention to the sin in my own life. That's what it would look like to live a life of humility, not keeping track of other people's mess up, saying, God, what do you have me to learn from this situation? This is a human problem, it's not new, it's not unique to us, the disciples had this issue. In Mark chapter 10, I want you to hear just a little snapshot of Jesus interacting with them. It says, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus, teacher, they said, We want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at the left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus asked. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left, that's not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. And when the 10 heard this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, 
and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must first be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all, for even the Son of Man, even Jesus himself, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So this idea that we you know, can admit that we're sinners in need of grace and in need of a Savior, but then quickly get distracted by like paving our own way or putting other people down. This is a problem as old as the disciples. I love that, that, um, you know, James and John have the initiative to be like, hey, Jesus, can we talk about the seating arrangements in heaven? If we could just get that locked down, like to go ahead and make sure, (laughs) like what kind of uh, arrogance does it take to have that conversation with Jesus? But Jesus takes an opportunity to teach. He says, look, in the world, people that get in positions of authority and power like lord it over the other people, right? They like rub it in, like you're, you're less and I'm more. Jesus says that's not the way it is in God's kingdom. Jesus says, if you wanna be first, you put yourself last. You make sure you are a servant of the people. You make sure you're serving the people around us. So if the why of humility is because we're sinners in need of grace, the who of humility is Jesus. Jesus is our model for humility. Jesus is, above all, our model for all things. Not just our Savior, but our model of how to live. There is a beautiful passage of Scripture in Philippians. Maybe, I think, one of the most beautiful um, parts of Scripture in Philippians chapter 2. It says there, this is a passage about Jesus. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit... If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're called in this passage to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The world, our culture, our community conditions us to a certain mindset. Right? It's a conditioning to say, watch out for number one, do whatever you can to pump yourself up. Have you ever been on LinkedIn? You see what people write about themselves and they're like, I am awesome, believe me. (laughs) Right? It's like the little tag on someone's picture. Our culture tells us this. I don't know if you've ever watched or coached little kids play soccer. Our our oldest um, was on his first soccer team about five years old and All of the play, you know, it's bunch ball. They're all just running around or building ball. And as the coaches and parents, we keep going, get the ball, get the ball. What the five-year-olds were doing was, oh, after you, you you have a turn. They were sharing. (laughs) We had conditioned them to share, right? We've been telling them all their life, you got to share. Don't take from somebody. They get on the soccer field. We're like, take it. (laughs) it. It's a little that way in our life and culture. And then we're trying to flip and learn to be more like Jesus. Our culture is telling us, take it. Look out for number one. Keep going, you know, be ruthless. And then we start to learn about the path of Jesus and we go, oh, wait, there's more than one way to go about this life. Have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus, which we're learning is to be obedient to God's will, not my will, but God's will. Because even Jesus didn't come to be served. He could have certainly deserved that kind of treatment. Jesus showed up to serve. He gave us a model of what is called servant leadership. The best leaders in the world know this concept. This idea that as a leader, you could lord it over other people. As a coach or a teacher or a parent or um, a worker or a boss, you could lord it over other people that you're in charge and that yours is the final say. But Jesus is saying, what about leading this way? Leading with service. The idea that we would serve the people around us as a model. This is the way Jesus led. He didn't walk into a room and go, all right, listen up. Let's go. 
That's not the way Jesus approached this. In fact, there's a really famous passage in John 13 about Jesus, and I'm just gonna read you just a little sort of action snippet. You can go back and catch this whole story later, because as I said, we're gonna hit on a lot of these angles of humility, but in John 13, verse 14, it says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, Jesus had just knelt down and washed the disciples' feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Jesus has gathered with the disciples. He has knelt down and put a towel around his waist and has in a basin washed the disciples' feet. Now, this was a time when you're walking around in sandals and your feet are gross and they're caked with dirt and who knows what else. This would have been the task of a servant. This is not something that you're leader, you're, um, the person you're looking up to, the person that's the best in the room would have been doing. And Jesus said, that's the point. You go about life and you treat people the way that you've been treated. You serve people the way that you want to be served. And that's why the community of God works this way. As leaders, which every one of you is in some sphere of your life, you approach it with servant leaders. So the why of humility is We need to be humble because we're all sinners in need of God's grace. None of us are more than the other. The who of humility is Jesus. Jesus is our model for this. Jesus is the one we look to when we get confused about what it might look like. We look back to Jesus, but how? How do we do it? Some of you maybe aren't feet people. So, you know, the washing physically of feet may or may not come up in your day-to-day life. I don't know. But how do we translate that principle of servant leadership into our daily lives. We've got another example in scripture, again from the book of John, this time from the third chapter. It's a character that we talked about not that long ago. His name is John the Baptist. We talked about him right before Christmas because John the Baptist's birth was foretold right before Jesus's, and his story is kind of unfolding parallel to Jesus's as Jesus is being born. He's born just before, and John's mission is to prepare the way for Jesus and his message. So John has been out there preaching repentance, teaching people. He's got his own set of followers who are helping him to do this work. So this is what we read happens. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where Jesus spent some time with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said, Rabbi, that man, Jesus, who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everybody's going to him. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given to them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I'm not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it's now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. John has been out there doing the work. He's been out there putting in the hours, preaching, teaching, baptizing, preparing the way. And now here comes Jesus, and his disciples are like, hey, you're the one that deserves all the attention. You've been here doing this stuff. And John was like, hey, he's the whole reason that I've been doing it. John could have gotten in that mode to be like, you're right. We need to put him in his place. But he understood that his whole mission and purpose in life was to raise up the name of Jesus, was to make Jesus's name famous. And he says, Jesus must become greater. I must become less. His disciples don't love this. Jesus is getting more popular than you. We we ought to do something about this. And John goes, that's the whole point. I want to make Jesus popular. I want to make Jesus known. That's what humility looks like in our lives. That's the how. When we think about humility, the starting point for us is God must become greater and I must become less. If I wanna live a life of following Jesus, I wanna make sure that throughout my life and over time and as I keep moving forward, that Jesus is becoming more and I am becoming less. I wanna care more about what God cares about than I care about my own agenda. I don't have that nailed. (laughs) I spend a lot of time thinking about my own stuff, the stuff that's really important to me. But what I wanna do is caring about the things that God cares about. Now, I wanna pause here and say, this is not saying neglect yourself, live the life of a martyr, it's not that, because 
one of the things God cares about is you. So caring for the things that God cares about, you're included in that list. So practicing self-care and loving yourself, that's all appropriate because, in fact, we, we've taught so many times here about love your neighbor as you love yourself. So a life of humility doesn't mean you neglect yourself, but it means you remember your importance. You are incredibly important to God, and so is everyone else. We keep that right size in our minds so that we can live this life of humility. I wanna think less about me and more about we, so that we're attending to the needs of this community, so that everybody around us is healthy and thriving and supported. Instead of fighting for a bigger piece of the pie, we make a bigger pie so that everybody has what they need in our community, so that we can serve people. I become less, Jesus becomes more. Over time, as I follow him, Jesus becomes more and more in my life, Jesus becomes more and more in the world. If you have been around Cokesbury for longer than a minute, you have heard the phrase, does anybody wanna to venture to say it? Next steps. You've heard about this, we've talked about this. We talk about it all the time, and that's because we really believe that anybody who's a follower of Jesus has a next step to take. But next steps, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but a next step is all about humility. The only reason you would need to take a next step is if you don't already know everything, right? The only reason you need to take a next step is if you admit that we're not yet like Jesus. If we've perfected it, if everything's done, if everything's great, we're like, cool, no more next steps. We reach the end, like, good job, everybody. Take a break, take five. But instead, we go, nope, we gotta keep going because humility is loving ourselves and our neighbor completely, just as we are, saying, God loves you totally as you are, but God is not done with me yet. That's what a next step is all about. It's, it's this journey with God to say, God isn't done with us yet. God's not done with you. God's not done with me. God's certainly not done with Cokesbury Church. It takes humility to admit that, to say, you know what? There's times we get it wrong, and we want to keep learning. We want to keep growing. It takes humility to say, you know what? I need to start the recovery journey. That takes a humble spirit to admit that you need some help. It takes humility to go, you know what, I wanna to go to divorce recovery because maybe I'm not healed in the way that I wanna be. It takes humility to go, my finances are not where I want them to be, I need some help. Or, you know what, I wanna know about the Bible but I don't know everything and I feel like embarrassed to ask but it takes humility to go, that's my next step. Or somebody to go, you know what, I want deeper relationships in my life but if I'm honest, most of the relationships that I'm in are kinda of on the surface or I wanna to give to the church but I've never done it and I don't know where to start. All of those next steps take humility to admit, I don't have it all done yet. I don't have it all figured out yet. I am a work in progress. I'm a work in progress always till the very last day of my life, till I go and meet Jesus face to face. That kind of humility will set the tone that kind of humility will start to change our lives from the inside out when we go, you know what, maybe I don't have to dig my heels in all the time and prove to everybody how smart I am and how much I know and how right I am and you're gonna follow after me. Instead, we use Jesus as our model of servant leadership. And then we spend our whole lives taking next steps because a humble person is a growing person. People who feel like they've got it all covered, people who feel like they know it all, that is a person who has stopped growing. That person is not looking to change. And I've been that person before. Maybe you're that person now or you've been at a different time in your life. It takes a humble person to be a growing person. We've all been in a situation where we eat a piece of humble pie because we publicly got it wrong or something happened where it was very obvious to everybody we did not know what we were doing. We don't have to get in that situation. We can just live a life of humility. Because you know what? I don't have to prove my worth to you or my value, or my intelligence, because I can rest knowing I'm fully worthy as a child of God. So got that covered. So now I can live a life that goes, hey, tell me more about that. Tell me more about your story. I, I wanna learn a little bit more about your perspective. I wanna understand. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. The only things I'm certain, certain about are that God loves us, God created us, and God saves us. And then after that, I need to listen. I need to know that the Holy Spirit can, 
can teach me new things that I can understand something in a new way. That's a kind of humility that's gonna set a tone. That's gonna set a tone for a different kind of life. So as we close today, we're gonna, when the band plays, we're open up this area, you can come and pray anytime. I want you to pray about what your next step is. What would it look like in your life to make this admission? I don't have it all figured out and that's okay. I can say it out loud with confidence because I know it's true of all of us. So we can take the lead on that in our workplaces, in our families, in our schools and say, I'm not it. I don't know it all, but I do know the person that does know it all. I do know the person that did save me, the person that created this world, the God who made us and who saves us through Jesus Christ. So you know what? I can, I can take the back seat. I can be less so that Jesus can be more. What's that step for you? What would it look like to walk out of this place with that kind of humility? We don't have to prove ourselves this week. All that we need to shine a light on is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we are coming to you today as people, we just admit it up front because you already know we're not perfect. And God, we look at the situations that are happening around us, the violence and the war and the racism and sexism and whatever other crisis is around us at the moment, we go, God, we don't know. Show us. We have the humility to say, help us to hear a new perspective. Holy Spirit, we are open to you moving in this room, moving in this community. Teach us something new. God, give us the courage to take a next step in faith today. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name, we are always praying. And everybody said, amen.